just going to go through my credentials. I'm a critical care specialist anaesthetist. My subspecialization has been in the evaluation of the quality of medical literature. And I've got a master's in health research methodology from that, from McMaster University. And it looks at how do we know what we know in medicine? How much confidence do we have in what we think is true? It's not like uh, physics where you can repeat the you know, test over and over. People are different, they're complex. So it becomes difficult to know what is true, what is real, what causes best outcomes for patients. I've published a lot, and at least a third to a quarter of that work is linked with the evaluation of the quality of evidence, meta-analysis, systematic reviews, breaking down how people did things, did they follow the best protocols, the best evidence processes? How can we evaluate this? And this is a whole specialization in medicine in of itself. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a child psychiatrist. I do not have any experience with teaching, uh, treating people or treating people with gender dysphoria, nor do I treat anybody. This presentation is not clinical advice and shouldn't be taken as such. I speak in my personal capacity, not as a member or a representative of any organization. I speak as a medical expert in the analysis of research quality, and I'm exercising my right to public expression as a South African citizen. To follow on this morning, it is loving to speak the truth lovingly, and that is why we do this. So to start off with that is to say that words are not violence and that disagreement is not hate. And if South Africa is to flourish, we need to take this seriously. Gender is anchored in biology. Gender is not a social construct. The statement that gender is a social construct is made through sociology departments without any factual basis. It is now reified and accepted as truth. Your children are taught it without any understanding or argument for why that is true. A man cannot become a woman. If you are a man, you're an XY chromosome, and that chromosome is in every single cell in your entire body. Every cell is sexed. If you are female, every cell in your body is sexed. If you are a trans man or a trans woman, You've been made to look like the other sex, surgically or through endocrine, uh, endocrinology. But your, what you are stays the same. You cannot change the reality. I like minions. <laughs> if you were here last night, I'm going to touch on a lot of the same things, but I'm going to build it up in the opposite direction and with a little bit more detail. I like pictures. It helps you to think. It helps me to think. I'm going to start off with what most people in South Africa used to think when they hear the concept of transgender and how we discuss these things. And the definitions and the terms that we use are critically important so that you can have constructive discussions. If I'm talking about the best rugby team in the world and how awesome they are and how good they are, and you are thinking of the Western province and I'm thinking of the Sharks, you're going to have a trouble. So, the first category, that white slide should have been a picture, is Casta Semenya. In South Africa, as a result of what has happened around Casta, when we talk about transgender issues, the average South African thinks about intersex, unfortunately. Intersex is a condition in which there is a biological problem in the way that we inherit, or that the way that our, inherit our sex genes, or the way that those genes work. So sex comes down to one thing, reproduction. You need a male to give you sperm, and you need a female to give you ovum. When a female's egg and the male sperm get together, there is a new life, a unique entity that has never existed before. That is why we are sex beings. To tell you that sex is not male and female, you need to go to university, and you need to be taught in a sociology department. Not in the biological fields. The people that will tell you that sex, that there's confusion around whether they are male and females, they all come out of the humanities. It is this easy. It is this simple. This is why there are two sexes. This is how it works. In humans, we've got 46 chromosomes, and they come in pairs, and the 
the sex chromosomes are come as an X and an X. If you have that combination, you develop as a woman. And if you have a Y chromosome in the mix, you develop as a man. If you don't have, the Y chromosome generates testosterone. If you don't ex get exposure to testosterone, you will develop as a female. The female pattern is almost like the default in which the cells will develop. We used to call problems around this intersex. We now call it disorders of sexual development. DSD is the abbreviation. But in the Folksmont, we call it um, intersex. There are two categories. You can have problems with your genetics, or you can have problems with your hormones and how you respond to those hormones. Nicola showed you the gender-bred person, and it is a lie that intersex is on a continuum. There are categorical issues, and they are well understood and easily defined. It's not a continuum. You don't have 30% male and 70% female. They fall into discrete categories. You can inherit these problems like you would inherit Down syndrome, or male pattern balding, or love for the sharks. <laughs> Turner syndrome was described by Turner. It's in conditions when women do not have a second X chromosome, X osin. The O stands for the, there is nothing there in that chromosomal position. Short stature, broad carrying angle of the arms, web neck, shield-like chest. That's what they look like, XO. It's not a continuum. If you've got three X's, you've got trisomy X. Taller woman, longer arms, issues with fertility. Woman, not on a scale, three X's. Kleinefelter syndrome, you've got a Y chromosome, you're male, you've got an additional X chromosome, specific clinical features. That's like inheriting a genetic problem. Now you could have normal genetics, normal sexual genetics. You've got XX or XY. But when your body starts to make the testosterone or the estrogen, your cells don't respond to it or you're unable to make it. And the most classic one is you are male, XY. You produce testosterone, but you don't respond to the testosterone. This is alpha androgen, androgen is testosterone, insensitivity syndrome, or 5-alpha reductase deficiency. So they're making testosterone incompletely or they're not responding to it. Think about this example. And the reason that we know about this is that you're born XY. You've got androgen insensitivity syndrome. You've got testes, they're making testosterone, your body's not responding to it. Because you're not getting testosterone, you look like a girl when you're born. Lift you up, oh, you're a girl. You look like a girl. You raised as a girl. You start to grow. Your genetic blueprint is male. So you are designed to grow slightly taller, carry more muscle mass. The testosterone is still there, although you're responding to it impartially or incompletely. When you enter into puberty, you start to grow faster than your peers. You start to put on more muscle than your peers. Your face starts to get that male look to it. Your Adam's apple starts to go. You run, and you run fast. You run faster than everybody in the school because you've got more muscle mass. You're taller, you're stronger. In all the explosive events, you do better. You run provincially, you win. You run nationally, you win. You run internationally, they drug test you because you're performing so well and they drug test everybody. Your testosterone levels are 10 times normal because you have testes and you're producing testosterone. And then you have a huge international outcry around this issue. And the co con concept becomes, where should, you be co where should you be competing in? That is why the issues around intersex in South Africa and Casa Semenya are, are so prominent and why we know about it. What is the Christian response to this scenario? Um, what's the, inverted commas, the sin? What's the issue? What's the moral issues here? So... Jesus is walking with his disciples, and there's a man that's been born blind. And the disciples said to him, who sinned that this man should be born blind? And Jesus says to him, or they say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? 
And Jesus says to him, nobody sinned. This man was born blind that God could be glorified through him. So, in the same way that I have inherited male paddle balding and a propensity to depression and an autoimmune arthritis, is that my fault? Did I sin because of that? Your health issues, did you sin because of that? Did you, you, sin, did you cause sin to inherit that? No. So, is there a sin in being intersex? No. Now, interesting, imagine that you are intersex. You're born in the 1800s. You're raised as a girl. You look like a girl. You can have sex because you have a vagina. You get married. You grow up with this, you grow with this man. You guys are infertile. You will live your whole life as a woman, congruent with what you understand yourself to be, and you will die and never know that you had intersex. Now, I want, imagine you live in today's state. Take my wife and I. We were unable to have kids. Imagine that I'm married to her. I think she's a girl. She looks like a girl. We have sex without any problems. We're growing up together. We want to have kids. Now, all of a sudden, we've been married in the church. So we're elders in the church. Now that one day we decide we want to figure out why we can't have children, we do a genetic test on her. It turns out that she's actually a man genetically. You think it through? What is the implication of that? Does the test change who she is or what she is? Because in the one scenario, you would have just continued on in a position. What do you do? Do we now divorce each other? So think about it from this perspective. You understand what intersex is. If you think about it without the genetic test, how would this go? What is the, what is the natural law telling you? What would the response be? response to be from that. The thing I want you to take away from this is that this is a medical condition. It is rare. People are discriminated against because they often look different. And in our society, there's a big issue about should Castor and other women, genetic men like this, be allowed to compete. All right. This is not transgenderism. It has been co-opted into the LGBTQIA plus thing as part of a strategy to gain people that are seen as oppressed to um, drive social change in it. Okay. Category two. This is Bruce Jenner. I didn't know about Bruce Jenner very well until I um, started looking at this. Bruce Jenner was an Olympian decathlete, won gold medal in, I think, in Los Angeles and then came out about 10 years ago as a trans woman, was crowned as Vogue's Woman of the Year in 2017. A caricature of a woman in many ways, a male's caricature of a, of a woman. Let's talk about gender and definitions. What is gender? How do we talk about it? Women have feminine characteristics, and men have masculine characteristics, and they are anchored in biology. In every single culture, there is a difference between men and women in their cultural expression of who they are. Even, and it's not a Western idea that has been pushed onto it, Amazonian cultures, African cultures, uh, Aboriginal cultures, every culture expresses a difference between men and women because we are different in how we are grow up, how we are influenced by our genetics, we are different. The expression of that varies in the culture. If I came today wearing a skirt, my nice uh, calves and high heels, you would feel very uncomfortable. But if I were in Scotland and I were wearing a kilt, you'd be going like, oh, that's quaint. Because it is acceptable, normal masculine expression of a man to wear a kilt in that society, but not in the South African society. So the expression of your masculinity, of your femininity, is dependent on the culture, but it is anchored in a biological knowing that this expression is linked to this biology. Does it have to be stereotypical? Are you allowed to vary it? 
Of course you are. But when you look at a thousand men and a thousand women, you are able to abstract the thing that is feminine or the thing that is masculine. My identity is how I feel inside of me. I feel like a man. I feel like a woman. I don't know where I fit in. And then I can choose to express this gender. Knowing what the categories are around me, I then dress in a certain way to push that or to make that statement about who I am. Notice again that when I choose to express a female gender, it is because my culture is reflecting a female gender back to me. I know what it is. And so I will take on certain things and I will wear a skirt and a frilly blouse because that is what women in my culture wear. In a different culture, I might dress like a different, like a woman. Gender is not a social construct. The statement that gender is a social construct comes from particularly a woman called Judith Butler, who's written a book, quite a few books around it, and her seminal one is called Gender Trouble. And she specifically makes the argument that gender is just a social construct. Because in doing so, she can break the categories of oppression of maleness and femaleness, and her main drive behind it is to be sexually free and liberal, liberated in what she wants to do. This statement is stands in the CSE curriculum in South Africa, and all the kids that have gone through that curriculum believe that gender is a social construct. It is expressed differently across cultures, and the best example is, I've heard about this is like trying to separate waves from the ocean. It's just an impossible job. Not all women have all the characteristics of feminist, of feminine characteristics. Just because you don't have the frilly hair doesn't mean that you're not a woman. It also doesn't mean that those characteristics don't exist. So in discussions with gender uh, theorists, they'll tell me, what is a female? I'll say, well, a female's got long hair and this and this. And they'll say, well, there's a female who doesn't have long hair. And here's a female that doesn't wear a dress. So there is no such thing as feminine, and it's all just a construct. But we know that they're there. What is a dog? A dog has got four legs, a tail, ears, it barks, and it's furry. Here's a dog with three legs that has no fur. It was abused. That dude's got his tail cut off, and the other one has got no ears. And you could take the larynx out of a dog so it doesn't bark. Is it still a dog? Yes. Just like a TV screen is made up of 100,000 pixels, show me the picture in those 100,000 pixels. You can't. But when you step back, you can see the TV screen. doesn't mean that the picture doesn't exist. So this is an argument that's made from the gender theorists against the fact that there is a gender like this. So Bruce Gender is an example of a person with classic adult or persistent gender dysphoria. This is the picture of the person that we learned at medical school. Bruce would have said that before about 10 years ago, this was called gender identity disorder. And I call it gender dysphoria. Dysphoria is a sense of deep, ongoing unease. Like euphoria, you win the lotto. Euphoria. Dysphoria, you lost the ticket to the lotto. <laughs> but it exists all the time. You constantly feel there's something deeply wrong, and that is because I feel like I'm a woman, but I'm trapped in this man's body, and it's just wrong, wrong, wrong. There's a pain that's linked to it. It has a massive impact on their lives. High incidence of depression, anxiety, high incidence of suicide, alcoholism, drug use, difficulties in holding down jobs. It's there all the time, from the point that they can remember. I'll tell that they insistently persistently, consistently will say, I'm not a boy, I'm not a boy, I'm not a boy, from the age of three, four, five. All the time. Not popping up later on. All the time. In the stats around gender dysphoria, we see it more common in men than in women. Men, one in 20,000 to three in 20,000. And in women, one in 50,000 50, to one in 30,000. So if a high school has got 500 people in it, you're going to need at least 10 high schools, 100 high schools, to be able to identify one girl with gender dysphoria. Now, 
there's five girls in one high school. This is what it's been all along. This is probably slightly undercounting what the truth is because of the way that society was and people were scared to come out about it. But even if we give it a tenfold reduction, it's an incredibly rare thing. I had never seen somebody with gender dysphoria during my medical training. And most people would never see somebody with gender dysphoria. What's the history of this? These people are struggling. They are in pain. They come to the doctor. They say, my life is falling apart. I can't cope with this, what's happening inside me. Help me. I've got all this, this suicidal attempt. I don't fit in anywhere. I'm anxious. I'm depressed. Please, let's, what can I do about this? So they seek help. The guys engage in psychotherapy and talk therapy and what can we do and doesn't seem to help. So then they say to them, well, maybe you want to be a woman. Does it make you feel better when we move you so that you now start to appear woman? So I'm socially transitioned. I start calling myself by a feminine name, stereotypical feminine name normally. I dress like a woman. Do I feel a bit better now? Okay, I do. Well, let's make you look a little bit more like a woman. So we give you surgery and hormones to transition you, give breast implants, remove your penis, get estrogen injections. And now does that make you feel better? The studies, long-term studies that come out of Sweden particularly, show that it doesn't. For the first three to seven years, there's a period in which the people feel a improvement of their anxiety levels. It's got a lot to do with the fact that there is now something being done about the problem. A lot of attention in a program, people are working around it, there's a community around it. But by seven to ten years and going on to 15 years, the same incidences of suicide, same incidences of depression, same incidence of alcohol use, loss of job issues. It's a very disappointing outcome. So the theory was then, well, if I, in my current build, height, and facial features, start to ingest, inject estrogen and wear female clothes, and you look at me, immediately you know I'm a man dressing as a woman. So what the Dutch did in the, one of their gender clinics is they said, let's try and transition these children before they go into the main phase of puberty so that I will never get my height and my width and my Adam's apple and the firmness of my face and give me my test, give me puberty blockers, then give me cross-sex hormones and give me surgery so that I can socially pass as a girl. And I've spoken with transgender uh, women who have, I spoke to her and I thought she's a woman and then in the discussion said, well, I'm actually a man. So the transition is getting successful to the point by doing this that they can pass socially. The Dutch study that pioneered this was based on, I'm not exactly sure, between 50 and 70 children. It was 50 and 70 children that are driving the whole, initiated this whole discussion of the entire world around this. There are more studies that have been done on top of this now. In perioperative medicine, there's about 15 million operations a year we consider it. I consider a big study, somewhere between five to 10,000 people before I can make an educated discussion or a, dis a discernment around whether something works or not. And that's whether somebody dies or lives within 30 days to 90 days. What we're doing here is embarking on a generational or multi-year thing where we're taking interventions here that are going to persist for the next 40 years and asking, does this improve people's outcomes? This approach is called the Dutch protocol. And it has been incorporated into what's called the WPATH guidelines. There are often international organizations that come together and put out standards of care. But standards of care statements are very carefully designed and laid out. And they are backed up by evidence statements and levels of evidence. This is how much we know about this. This is what it thinks. The WPATH group is a voluntary group of associated professionals and interested people that have come together. These are not standards of care. These are guidelines, and they've been critiqued quite aggressively by people who feel that a lot of this is being driven ideologically. So before you go into your first, second stage of puberty, so you start to develop breast or your genitalia start to enlarge puberty blockers, then at around 16 cross-sex hormones, and then around 18 surgery. What is your response to a person that is struggling with gender dysphoria? What is a Christian response to someone with gender dysphoria? 
I want to point you to the man who was born blind. Who sinned that he should be struggling with gender dysphoria? Who sinned that I should be struggling with depression? Who sinned that that person has schizophrenia? Who sinned that this person has body dysmorphic disorder where I'm uncomfortable with my body and it just feels wrong to me? Who sinned that somebody should have gender dysphoria? Nobody. This is a cross that this person must bear. There is nothing intrinsically wrong, immoral, with the fact that they are struggling with their identity. What do trans persons who come to know Christ do? What is the testimony that we get from Christians who became Christians after they had transitioned? They all talk about finding their identity in Christ. They no longer talk of themselves as being transgendered persons or dysphoric persons. They talk about being a Christian, a follower of Jesus. They accept that their dysphoria is not their core identity. They all talk about picking up their cross and having to bear that. And we all ought to pick up our cross and bear it. Is it a same-sex attraction? Is there something inherently sinful in the fact that you are attracted to somebody of the opposite sex? Or is it acting on that? Is there something wrong that I am attracted to a female that is not my wife? Or is that I lust after it and act on it? Is there something inherently wrong that I am tempted to steal? Or is it that I dwell on it and I steal? If I am attracted to children from a pedophile and I don't act on it, that's my cross to bear. I have the privilege of knowing a guy who grew up with same-sex attraction to boys under the age of 16. He's a pedophile. He's a homosexual. He has come to know the Lord. He knows that the desire is immoral, that it is wrong. God has given him a freedom from that. From He's married. He has kids. He witnesses around this. This is his cross to bear. These persons, these trans persons say, we are no longer just gender dysphoric. We are followers of Jesus Christ. They stop the hormone therapy, and they generally don't. They, they return back to expressing a male or a female gender based on the biological gender, and they don't have surgery again just because of the invasiveness of the whole process. If you are a gender dysphoric Christian, what are you to do? The first thing is realize that your body is sacred. Your body is a whole you are not just a soul or some spirit floating around in a piece of tissue that is to be discarded and thrown away. Jesus Christ granted humanity worth and value by taking on flesh. He became flesh himself. What we have has been created in his image and it is worthy to be looked after. It is not eternal in that we will get something new and a new body. But this is not something that you discard and throw away. Find your identity in Jesus Christ. You are not your burden. It is not the thing that defines you. Accept that your identity is not your dysphoria. And this is something that you will have to bear. Don't have hormonal therapy. Don't have the surgery. How do we as a church, as followers of Jesus, the person next to you, engage with somebody that is having these struggles? First thing is we deal with these people like Jesus would deal with them, like we would deal with anybody else who doesn't know the Lord. Build a true friendship with them that's based on the recognition of their humanity, their value. Jesus died for them. You can have coffee with them. Demonstrate God's love as Christ did. Every person has intrinsic value. Trans people have great value. Homosexual people have great value. Western Cape rugby supporters have got great value. <laughs> Be wise with the names and the pronouns. I often get this thing where people feel that if I call somebody by the wrong pronoun, in some way I'm helping them in their uh, confusion, and it's my responsibility to help them right by calling them by the name that they should be called. Well, if I introduced myself as Sam, even though it was Raitzer, I could be a boy, I could be a girl, I could be, if you like, said that I use the French term, the Madeleine or something like that, how, who are you to decide on my name? And when I talk with you, you never use the pronoun he, she to my face. 
So when you're sitting opposite somebody in a conversation, respect them. You will call them by the name that you want to, they want to be called. Are you going to say, no, I'm not going to call you John. You look like a, you know, a Sam. I'm sorry, I refuse to do that. It just doesn't work like that. You can't be compelled to speak in a certain way. A school cannot compel people to speak, use he or she pronouns. And that is something that we need to go to court to, to defend. But if you ask me to do it, I will do it for you. Don't put the family rules on people that are outside the family. At our house, come sit next to me, my son, and he eats with his hands, and he's lounging like this, and my other one's eating with his mouth open. He gets the fifth degree from all of us. Close your mouth for the 50th time. If you're not going to do that, you can go and sit in the bedroom. Those are the rules here. But if you come to visit our house, I will not say that to you, even if you eat with your mouth open. Because you're not part of the family. The rules of Christianity don't apply to people that are not followers of Jesus Christ. There is one issue. Do they know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Because once they know him and they're in the family, they are renewed, they are reborn, and it's an inside-out change that happens. We're so focused on the rules, and what does this mean? We've missed the individual. This mindset is, must be with us as individuals when we engage with the people around us. Persistent gender dysphoria. Got it? Bruce Jenner. All right. Intersex caster. Persistent classic gender dysphoria. Bruce. Next category. Transient gender dysphoria or a desister. To persist is to continue with an action. To desist is to stop. You get a cease and desist. Stop and don't do it again order from the court. Children will go to a psychiatrist. Their parents will take them to a psychiatrist because they have gender dysphoria. This is before this current phase. So something's going wrong with my kid. My kid keeps saying, I don't fit in. I'm not a boy. I'm not a boy. I'm not a boy. So I go to the psychiatrist. Out those children that present, out of the group of children that present to a child psychiatrist, they will not all persist as gender dysphoric patients. The majority of them will no longer persist and it will go away when they enter into puberty. Here's a study, a follow-up study. The reason I'm showing is this, this is a new study. It's in the, uh, in the 2000s that it was published. They looked at 129 participants. 12% persisted through adolescence and 87% desisted. Didn't transition them, looked at them, what happened? 80%, 8 out of every 10 from a current study, no longer had gender dysphoria. There is resolution in the gender dysphoria between 60 and 80%. 6 out of 10 to 8 out of 10 of all children who present with gender dysphoria, it will go away. There are high incidences of other co-pathologies in people that present with gender dysphoria. High incidences of autism. And autism is a very rigid way of seeing the world. So an autistic child will say, men wear blue shirts and women wear green skirts. If I, I don't like wearing blue shirts. I'm not a boy. So, and I can't be a boy because I don't like blue shirts. That rigidity of thought. And so they come out and say, I don't want to be a boy anymore. There's also high incidences of same-sex attraction. You're moving into a pattern of establishment of how I relate to other people. All the other boys are doing this towards girls. I don't feel that towards the girls. I don't fit in. I'm not a boy. There is no reliable way to identify who will persist and who will desist. All the top child psychiatrists say this. The WPATH guidelines say this. The only people that I've heard say that they know how to do it are people who I think profoundly overestimate their, their ability and seem to be maybe willfully ignorant of what the literature says. We don't know. There's no tests to identify who will do this. The Dutch are the guys that have led a lot of it. This guy's called Stian Smar, is one of the major researchers. Before the age of 10, we suggest the cautious attitude towards transitioning. Some girls who are almost but not entirely living as boys in the adult years 
ex experienced great trouble when they wanted to return to the female gender. We believe that parents and caregivers should fully realize the unpredictability of their child's psychosexual outcomes. A world expert saying, we are not sure. And somebody here says, I know there's a problem. If you take a child who would have desisted, would have stopped, and you put them in a social transition, they persist. You can move a desister into a persister, make the problem continue, because children are malleable like they, and because they're still in a formative way. And here's a study that demonstrates that there was a 93% persistence in the gender dysphoria when you socially transition them. So if you left them and didn't transition them, they would 80% of them will grow out of it, 60 to 80% of them. Now you lock them into it if you do socially transition them. There are concerns about the use of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. The first question is, is it appropriate to treat children that will desist? Because if you look at the protocols now, you need to start giving the blockers before they get the sexual sex injury characteristics. But are you locking them into a process in which they will, can no longer escape from? What is the effect on your health, your psychology, your psychosexual development? One of the problems is that you don't feel part of the group. Now I'm giving you a puberty blocker so you stop growing while everybody else continues to grow. You become less part of the group and more isolated from the group. People that use puberty blockers for the control of cancers where they were developed showed changes in their memory development. What happens to a child who's going through the peak phase of growth development when on the puberty blockers? Puberty blockers affect bone density. You start taking cross-sex hormones. Now you're giving estrogen to a man or androgens to a woman. There's issues with cancer, prostate cancer, uh, blood clotting, heart attacks, strokes. Once people start down this path, they are locked in. They don't stop. You don't get the detransitioning. Just as a note, every quote that I've given here comes out of the WPATH guidelines, which are considered the inverted commas standard of care. This is Rachel Levine. She's the highest transgender uh, person in the Biden government, U.S. Sec Assistant Secretary for Health. Says there is no argument among medical professionals about the value and the importance of gender-affirming care. Gender-affirming care says, if a child says they are female or male, they are female or male, you must treat them immediately. Here's Dr. Stiensma, world leader in the Dutch clinic. We don't know whether the studies we have done in the past, this is talking about Bruce Jenner, can be applied to this time. Many more children are registering in a different type. Suddenly, there are many, many more girls applying who felt like a boy. While the ratio was the same in 2013, so before that, more men, now the same in 2013. We're now seeing three, sorry, three times as many girls registering and presenting to the clinic. So is the population that we studied here the same as the population that we've seen here? Can we use the information that we got here and apply it to this group over here? The Swedish National Board of Health and Welfare, these guys have been at the forefront of the transgender movement. They write, the evidence base for hormonal interventions is low quality. Hormonal treatments carry risks. Evidence for pediatric transition differs markedly from the initial study populations. There's increasing numbers of detransitioners, people who have transitioned and said, whoa, I made a mistake, I don't want to do this, and transition-related regret. Once you cut off your breasts, or if you're in cross-sex hormones for two years, you're infertile. It's never coming back. My wife and I were pretty confident we never wanted children in our arrogance. And when we got to 40, we had changed our mind. What do you do when you're 16 and you're making a choice about your long-term, lifelong fertility? Transition in minors should only be done as part of a clinical trial. They pulled back in Sweden dramatically because of the concerns around this, and they said in children you can only do this as part of a clinical trial because we do not know. 
The Finns research data is limited. Extensive data needs to be collected. We need more information on detransitioners. We need more information on GRET. They pulled back. The NHS has been having a huge discussion around this. They've been following standardized methodological processes to assess the quality of the research and the work that they're doing. It's being run by a woman, a pediatrician called Dr. Cass. She's the head of this process. They published two meta-analyses, which takes all the data published and tries to synthesize it into an answer. And the meta-analytic data showed that there's a lack of strong research. We can't trust it. We don't know what's going on. About two months ago, she put out a report. It says the evidence supporting gender affirmative care is inconclusive, both nationally and internationally. Longer-term follow-up is needed on those who desisted, especially those who experienced regret or detransitioned. We can give no definitive advice in this report due to the gaps in the evidence. They closed the Tavistock Clinic, where a lot of this work was being doing. Firstly, they said because there were too many people coming to it and there was too long a waiting list, but that the methodology that they were following was flawed, that they were following too affirmative and not really questioning what was going on there. And the NHS is now facing a class action lawsuit, as reported in the Times, of potentially up to a thousand children that are suing the NHS. This has happened in Sweden and Finland. This is the French National Academy of Medicine. Great medical caution must be taken given the vulnerability and the many undesirable effects and even serious complications. Great caution is in needed. There's an impact on growth, bone density, sterility, emotional, intellectual consequences, and for girls, menopause like symptoms. The Australians and the New Zealand Council, uh, College of Psychiatrists, at present there is a paucity of quality evidence on the outcomes of those presenting with gender dysphoria. In particular, there's a need for better evidence in relation to outcomes for children and young children. Karolinska University, which is in Sweden, one of the forefront, no longer providing puberty blockers or drugs or cross-sex hormones to children under the age of 16, concerns about the long-term effects, questions about the ability to give informed consent under the age of 16. It can only be done in a clinical trial context. Meta-analysis from high-quality organizations that don't have a finger or a vested interest in this, weak observational studies, insufficient evidence, low uncertainty, unknown long-term side effects. Everything that I put here is referenced, can be obtained from here. Tavistock being sued, the consequences for getting it wrong, this include allegations that it recklessly prescribed puberty blockers with harmful side effects and adopted an unquestioning affirmative approach to children identifying as transgender. It is not true that they're being sued because they didn't get access to the clinic. This is what it says in the papers by, through which they're being sued. I want to ask Ms. Levine, how can this statement of hers be, there is no argument among medical professionals? She's speaking as an individual here when the national French, Nor uh, Swedish, Finnish, UK, Australian, New Zealand guys are saying, stop. If you hear the statement that there is no debate about it, it's just absolutely not true. How do we respond, not as individuals now, as a community, as South Africans? We need to protect children. Yes, the people that are driving the idea that we must affirmatively treat children with gender dysphoria particularly thinking in a persistent gender dysphoria context, feel that they are doing the best for the child because they are trying to help the child that they can have a better life. But the principle in medicine is first do no harm. Let it be until you know that what you're going to do isn't worse than what's going to happen. The research that we've done in the past around the use of beta blockers, drugs that slow your heart rate around surgery, we made a massive mistake in it. We followed data from a small trial, this is internationally. The trial showed that beta blockers helped. It became standard of care in the US. Your hospital was fined if you didn't use a beta blocker. We did a big study, I was part of it, 8,000 patients, showed that beta blockers reduced heart attacks after surgery, but you got more strokes because your heart wasn't beating as fast and more people died and people had debilitating neurological strokes. So you were alive, but you couldn't walk. 
We reckon that we kill between 40 and 80,000 people in Europe as a result of following this care. That's why medicine's rule is first do no harm. And first do no harm is multiplied so much more when you talk about children. A rational approach around this is watch and wait. Watching and waiting doesn't mean you do nothing for the child. The child is not just a gender dysphoric. The child is a child in an environment with stresses, with family, with biological issues. The child must be treated and integrated as a whole. And this is the approach that the Dutch have followed. But the rest of the world seems to have ignored this component of it. And the Dutch have said that the world must stop blindly following their protocols because they're not following them appropriately. Transition, I believe, should be done in the context of a clinical trial in South Africa. And we need to engage again with the individuals as Jesus would. Both those with gender dysphoria and those who are transitioning children. They're not the enemy. The enemy is not that person that God created. The enemy is the enemy. And we are here to represent Jesus to them and be ambassadors to them. Trans and gender dysphoria. Last category. This is the one that's causing all of the pain at the moment in the schools. Rapid onset gender dysphoria. This terminology that I've used here is highly contested. This is a new phenomenon, never seen before. In adolescent girls predominantly, between the ages of 14 and 18, it happens in clusters of girls, female to male. So there's a group of girls, three or four of them, that decided that they are now transgender and they want to be men. No prior history of gender dysphoria. Doesn't fulfill the criteria, as we've seen in persistent, the classic gender dysphoria. It's something new. It has the features of a craze. It breaks out in small groups, often one or two that become transgender, around them become a group of non-binary children, and one or two that are same-sex attracted. It, is a, it will often be in schools, in social clubs, or groups online. It is a high social value action. You go, I don't know how really cool and suave you guys felt when you were going through puberty, you know? You like arms and legs and hair and bump and you don't know where you are. And if you're in the bottom of the social ladder, you don't fit in anywhere and you now say that you're trans, you move to the top of the pile. You are lauded and said, well done. And there's a reason for why you're so gangly because I'm actually trans. So you move up on the curve. Children often have co-pathologies, depression, anxiety associated with cutting and eating disorders, often a trauma that has happened in the family or some type of trigger that will, that will link onto it. It is strongly, strongly, strongly driven by social media. Carl and them were saying that the average child on the phone will spend between four and five hours a day on the phone, and the information that they're getting, it has certain rules online around transgender. Rule number one, if you think you are trans, you are. That's the, that's the first rule. There's no, because they're getting advice from trans children and trans activists. So if you feel uncomfortable in any way about your sexuality, the reason for that is that you are trans. It doesn't matter if you had a bad night that night, or if you're just tired, or if you're feeling depressed or anxious, or you failed your test, or your boyfriend rejected you, you are trans. The next thing is nobody else cares about you except your trans family online. Here is how you tell your family, your mother, and the doctors, the script, so that they will get you the magic drug, which is testosterone. And once you get T, then your life will improve. And that is the script that runs through it. And people are coached and followed through and made to step away from their family, and this is how it goes. Societally, it's driven by an acceptance of the ideology that you are taught in school that gender is fluid. It's a construct. The thing that you are who you think you are. I can be anything I want. I can be any person that I want. And it's strongly linked with what Nicola's been talking about, is the social justice, woke movement, queer theory. Children are now rejecting the need for dysphoria. We go onto these sub-edits like Tumblr and Reddit. You start looking through that. You just go down into this huge society. If you believe that you must have a medical diagnosis before you transition, you're known as a transmed. You're transphobic against people 
because you need a medical diagnosis. Because if gender is fluid, why do I need a diagnosis? Why should the doctor be the gatekeeper? I can be whatever I want to be. And linked into this whole thing, beyond the doctors, is an aggressive activism that links into what Nicola has been talking about that just distorts it, making it really difficult to have careful, thoughtful, rational discussion. Suddenly, there are many more girls applying who feel like a boy. All of a sudden, the whole dynamic has changed. Abigail Schreier, she's a liberal American, writes this book, Irreversible Damage, the Transgender Craze that is Seducing Our Daughters. And she talks about, she's a feminist, she would be called what is, she's now known as what is a TERF, Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist. Because she has, she says she's fought to be a feminist to protect the rights of women to be women and to seen as women. But the trans extreme philosophy rejects the existence of that biological thing that they fought for, and so doing nullifies and destroys what it means to be a woman. Okay, four categories. If, that, if there's one thing that you take away from this, take away these categories, that these are not the same. Disorders of sexual development slash intersex, persistent gender dysphoria, D-sisters, and rapid onset or adolescent onset gender dysphoria. The data is not the same. It is absolutely illegitimate to take data and results from DSD and apply it to trans transgender dysphoria. It is unethical. It is it's just wrong. You cannot take data from white mice and apply it to children in utero. It would be a total disregard for the safety of that process. You cannot take data from Bruce Jenner and apply it to a teen. To think that these things are the same is fundamentally to reject what we know around it. To pretend that this is one homogenous thing is massively to misrepresent this. If you want to be intellectually honest, you want to be careful and thoughtful and respectful for the people that you're looking after, you must differentiate between these. And again, the takeaway for you as you talk about this and try to think about it, think about the difference in these categories. If you're a teen and you're feeling unsure about your identity, that does not make you transgender. Just because I'm not sure who I am today doesn't mean that you are gender dysphoric. It is a normal part of growing up. I don't know some days, you know, which was left or right. And the girl rejects you, you know, what do you do? It'll be so much easier. Somebody whistles at you or you know, tries to feel you up and you're a girl and you feel vulnerable and I don't want to be a girl because I'm being attacked or intimidated and so it's easier for me to boy. That doesn't make you gender dysphoric. There are many other factors that can be present as gender dysphoria in children. Those that are same-sex attracted, those that have a depression, anxiety, acute loss, if there's abuse, um, children on the autism spectrum. And then hidden in there, there are children that have got gender dysphoria. And talking to people that have got true gender dysphoria, there's a sense of anger that everybody in the world now has gender dysphoria. While we are sitting here and we've been fighting for this thing and we're getting lost in the true pain and the true thing that's what's going on here. Because there's been this medicalization with the cultural effect around um, adolescence. So I want to step back for a second. I've talked to you about the medical stuff. There's a philosophy that underpins it. So we're moving on to philosophy. Your worldview, the way that you see the world, underpins everything that you do. And what you believe is true, you act on. And those actions create a society. This is why thinking about stuff and knowing what is true is so important. It's what Nicola's been talking about. We build a society on what we believe is true. The philosophy of transgenderism says that gender is socially constructed completely to just word games. It has no coupling with biological reality. Biological sex is irrelevant. If I think I'm a cat, I'm a cat. If I think I'm a dog, I'm a dog. Everybody laughs a little bit, sounds a bit weird. If I think I'm fat, I'm fat. That's the definition of anorexia. 
People like this will look at themselves in the mirror and decide, I am overweight, I'm ugly, I need to lose more weight. As Carl Lim said, highest mortality rate in psychiatric disease. Is it loving for me to affirm their belief that they are fat? If I can be transbiologically transsexual, why can't I be transracial? Why is sex so malleable, but race is absolutely inviolable? This is a white woman, uh, Rachel Dalazar, who presented, who identified as being African American. And so she presented herself to the society as African-American, ran and af headed up an African-American group until she was outed as being white, castrated in the media, excuse the terminology, but um, totally ripped apart. How dare she? But why? What's the big issue? If I can transcend my biological sex, why can't I transcend my racial? I'm assigned to being a white male forever. I don't have to listen to that category. If I can be transsexual or transracial, why can't I be transspecies? This is Boomer, the dog. Guy identifies as a dog, wears that costume at home, drinks and eats out of a bowl. It's called Boomer. What about a cat? What about mythical creatures like dragons? If I can be whatever I want to be, why can't I be these? When a trans activist says, this trans person is a boy. I am a boy who is now a girl. They mean that they are a girl. And for you to say that they are not a girl is for you to reject their existence. They are a girl. And you are hateful. And you are bigoted. And you are hom uh, transphobic for not accepting the fact that I am a girl. And when I am a boy, though I'm biological, I am a boy. The fact that I can have children and breastfeed has nothing to do with it. I am a boy. That's the philosophy. And that is why the U.S., you can now have birthing persons or chest feeding or men can be raped or men can be pregnant because they now are this thing. You've seen this. To say what of what is that it is not, or of what is not that it is, is false. Well, to say of what it is that it is, and what is not that it is not, is the truth. To assert what is real is truth. To deny what is real is falsehood. It is anchored in reality. The ultimate reality is Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. True love is setting your will to consistently seek the true good of the other. It will mean saying, as I put up in the beginning, that sex cannot change. A man cannot become a woman. And it is loving for me to tell you that in love. And it is a dereliction of duty not to do that. I do not do that in judgment. I'm not standing there, but to not tell somebody, for me not to stand here and to tell people about what the evidence base is, is not loving of me. It rejects my, it is to give up the responsibility that we have to talk about this. And remember that God so set his will to seek our true good. He so loved us that he gave us his son, Jesus Christ. I teach at a school and there's already a girl that falls into the category, category that you spoke about. Um, if I should get a person coming to me, a little girl or a boy, saying I have gender dysphoria, practically what would be my first step? Do, who do I refer them to? Are there an identified group of, of therapists that I can say, or, or do I say, I need to speak to your parents? What's the generally the very first practical step that I as an educator they need to take? So the first step that I would say is that you need to uh, deal with the child directly. The child's coming to you with a problem. That's a huge sense of um, trust and responsibility that they put in you. You're there as a teacher, not as a parent. And so the first thing that I would be wanting to look at is to make sure that the child is safe, 
and be thinking, why is this coming to me? So you wouldn't want to talk to the child and make sure that you know that you've heard them and that you um, will respect what they tell you and that they can trust you. Second point is you are the teacher at the school. The person with the authority and responsibility is their parents. And the child needs, the parents need to know what's happening. I think when we move to the point where somehow the parents are cut out of that, going down an incredibly dangerous path. And that's what we've seen happening in the US. So I think you need to talk to the child, particularly, maybe not so much now, but there's often these kids have been, there's abuse issue, particularly with young girls or there's bullying, or there's sexual bullying that's happening. And an approach to me being objectified, and we talked about the pornography issues, is, is to, if I'm no longer the girl, I can be safe. Or if I can be a boy, I can be powerful. And so I want to take that on. So there's a lot going on there. So without a doubt, I think you need to engage with, um, with the parents. Um, in South Africa, we've got a problem around how do we deal with this, because in many places, the only approach seems to be one of affirmation. And the loudest voices that we hear are say, if you don't affirm this child, she's going to commit suicide. Because they take data from the um, persistent gender dysphorics and apply it to these children who are rapid onset gender dysphorics. So finding Christian psychologists and psychiatrists and psychoanalytic specialists who can listen to the child, not try and convert them into something different, but listen and hear what they're saying. The complaints that the people from the Tavistock Clinic had was, we rushed into this thing, because here's an answer, and the medical answer is the way to do it. To sit and counsel them and talk to them and listen to them and understand them and unpack it. And statistically speaking, the chances that this child is true gender dysphoria, and they had no gender dysphoria beforehand, it was almost zero. So I think you need to have compassion and love for that child, but you need to also understand where your role starts and the, peer, and the schools is limited and where the, where the child goes on. Again, I want to say it is a false dichotomy that there's only two ways of dealing with this child. You will hear in all of the discussions and all their attacks and stuff, it's either my way, which is affirmative treatment fully, and anything else is conversion therapy. That's not true. Have a look at what the, US, the Australians and the New Zealanders say. Look at a lot of people saying, we need to talk about this child. The child is not just a gender. They need to understand what's going on in their own life. They just need to talk with somebody listening. So, yeah, that would be my approach. There's also a role for Christian psychiatrists and psychologists, and not even Christian psychiatrists and psychologists, but for Christian psychiatrists and psychologists who believe that this is a broader issue to come together and form an uh, uh, integrated response that is not necessarily affirmative. I found quite a good rapport with some trans people and trans counselors that are saying, what these guys are doing is wrong here. It's too extreme. And then also on the church side is saying, no, we don't do anything with this. They must just come right and we're going to pray them right. Between this, there's a true balance, a thoughtful, loving, careful balance. And there's room in South Africa for us to develop a coalition across that group where we can respond to. So um, if an individual is a, has got an XY chromosome, saved, believes Christ, follows the love, and gets the love from church and everything, would that mean that individual should and will behave like a female in all fashions of what we understand as a female? So XY is male. Oh, sorry, I got it wrong way around, yeah. Okay, okay. so XX, right then. Let's talk about XX. I mean, if, if genetically that the gene says that person is a female, and everything else that you said about religion and, and, and getting, getting saved and everything, those, those things are being done. That person should and would behave like a female. No. And if not, where do we then accept or not accept? So we always accept. So, so the issue is that they are a woman. That's what they are. How do women behave? On average, I can identify how women behave. 
But some women behave very differently from men. Women generally caricature warm, nurturing, loving, want children. There are some women who don't want children at all and never will want children. They'd exist. She's not less woman. So the behavior of the woman, but she's not saying, I want to be a man. I think, I mean, like, think of homosexuality. If that person is a male, but he wants to have, he's got a male attraction, is it then fine for that person to have homosexual engagements? Or should he, through the blood of Christ, still focus on female attractions? Or, I mean, where, where do we do that level of acceptance, I mean, or, or, or yeah, approval or stuff like that? Because Okay, so, so one of the problems that I come across a lot in this discussion is that transsexual transsexuality or transgender issues is not homosexuality or same-sex attraction. So somehow, a lot of people, when I do this talk, seem to think that somehow genetically, when we talk about intersex, we're talking about homosexuality. We're not talking about my sexual attraction. We're talking about my identity as a male or a female. And there are two, they are integrated often, and I think it's a false presentation to assume that they are split. Because within the transgender, classic persistent transgender, there's obviously a sexual component to this or the way that they present themselves. Your question then is, to what degree do we accept somebody despite their sin? That is what you were asking. Because if I'm a man, and according to Christian teaching, I may not engage with sex with another man. That is wrong. Well, that's wrong. Do I condemn you? Do I hate you? No. Do I let you into my church and come and worship with us? Yes. You say that you're a Christian and you are engaging in an ongoing homosexual behavior, and I need to talk to you and say, you're not living consistently with what Christ teaches us. And then you continue to do that and you continue to do that. Then at some stage, I need to say to you, brother, you've either committed your life in submission to Jesus Christ or you haven't, and we will see from the fruit of your life. So I accept you, accept your person, your value in Jesus Christ, your createdness, but the fact that you continue to sin in that behavior, that's a problem, and I don't accept that. So the homosexual friends that I have say, I have same-sex attraction. I'm attracted to other men. I, as Reza, am attracted to pretty women. I do not engage in sex with them. They do not engage in sex with men that they are attracted to. They are same-sex attracted. They do not act on the sexual. So we turn sexual things into something, inverted commas, special. So the way to think through this stuff is just make it another sin. I really like those crutches. So I'm going to steal those crutches because I want them. I'm attracted to the crutches. There's a desire. I'm tempted. The temptation is not the sin. Jesus was tempted. The sin was he bows down and he makes himself God. That would be the sin. When I decide that I set the rules is where I sin. So there are um, quite a few pastors that have written books around this. Aubrey, what's his first name? Um, there's a British uh, pastor who's same-sex attracted. He writes about his story. He says this is how he thinks about homosexuality. The act of homosexuality is not approved by Scripture. It's, it's outside the ambit of what is good for mankind. To in repeatedly insert your penis into an anus causes damage to the anus. Over time, men that have sex with men develop anal incontinence. They de develop damage to the rectal tissue because it's too thin to sustain thrusting into it. Monkeypox is a consequence of men putting their penis into the rectum. There's a reason why the body hurts when it does that. When you have sex appropriately lubricated into a vagina, it's not painful. When you have sex into the anus, you have to apply insistent lubrication. You have to wash out the anus so that you don't have uh, push into fecal matter. The body says to you, this is not good. And over time, it causes problems. This is why the HIV crisis was so high in uh, homosexual populations, because it was men having sex with men. 
and it causes a lot of tissue trauma, it causes bleeding, and that's why they've got high incidences of HIV. So both in Scripture, it says do not do this because it's not good for you, but physically, it's also not good for you. So you can then, that's the argument for saying this is not in your interest to do this. Not every desire that I have in my heart is good. Just because it is a natural desire doesn't make it good. I have a natural desire to get angry and to punch somebody in the face when they cut in front of me on the road. It's not a right desire. A kleptomaniac has the desire to steal. It's a natural desire to steal. It doesn't make it right. If I have a desire to take somebody sexually or have somebody sexually, it doesn't make it right. In fact, in the most part, society is built around restricting that which is my natural desire. That's what we call a civilized society. There are rules that restrict us to allow us to function independently. So the church looks at all sinners, which is all of us who have been redeemed through Jesus Christ. If you are outside the family, we welcome you because we want you to come and sit next to the table with Jesus Christ and be redeemed with us. And when you sit at our table, we all need to learn how to eat properly. I have to deal with my arrogance. I've had to deal with pornography issues. I have to deal with depression and how I deal with that. I never get it 100% right. Every day I pray that God would help me to take me through this day and I can walk closer with Jesus. If you fall and stumble, that's okay. But then you need to repent and you need to come back. But if you willfully and consistently reject what Jesus Christ says, and as a Protestant church we believe what Christ says is in the Bible and we follow that guideline, then after a while the church needs to say, you can't, you, you can't be one of us because you don't submit to Jesus. Jesus says he's the lion and the lamb. He gives us salvation, but he is the lion. You must submit because he's your king. If you don't submit to the king, you're not part of the kingdom. So that is me and my approach. My love for this person is Jesus died for you. I will present you with everything that he has if you would come to him. And the truth is if you don't submit to him, there's a consequence to that. So that's where we put that in. That's the approach that I would take on it. And this is why people that come to Jesus Christ, who were trans, return back to the biological sex. Because they no longer persist in a pattern of behavior that is contrary to how God has, has um, formed them and has created them. So they're coming in alignment with what Scripture is teaching them, what the natural world has shown them to do through their biological position. The problem that we get in the liberal church is, is that it is the inverted commas love and compassion for this person, and then by restricting their sexual activity, we deny who they are. And that is the problem that we have. We are not sexual. Our core identity is not sexual. Our core identity is created as humanity to glorify God, and everything else must be brought in line with it. So this thing that I've said now, when viewed by um, activists, will incense them, and viewed by uh, liberal Christians will incense them. But it's part of the belief of Christianity. And this is why we will face persecution. Because whether I like it or not, this is what Jesus said. It would be a lot easier if it wasn't like that. You know, then I could just go on with my life. But if I say that I believe the king and the king says this, well, then I need to stand. And also, it's not healthy for you to do this. It causes damage to your body. So why would I encourage you? Do I now let you continue to do what you want to do because it makes you feel emotionally okay but it's causing physical damage to your body it just doesn't make sense so that's where the line is again it's there's truth but it needs to be dealt in with with love and compassion and respect